Division of History and Philosophy, and I'd like to welcome you to what we come to call the umpteenth annual <laughs> Mitchell McPherson Lecture. We've actually lost count. You would think with some 15 to 20 historians in the room, we should be able to get that, get that number down. And we'll, we'll work on that. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to have you. I'd, I'd like to be, I'll be the one to remind you uh, that when we're listening to the uh, listening to the talk, let's be uh, cognizant of the fact that there are others around listening as close as they can. So uh, please reduce any distractions and, and put away the cell phones and we would be very grateful uh, for you doing that. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce the individual who's brought our uh, speaker to campus. Dr. Marty Olaf uh, is the archivist and an historian at the University of Troy Dothan campus. And so uh, he'll introduce our speaker for you, for us. Thank you. Since I'm from Dothan, I'll bring you the traditional Dothan greeting. Hey, y'all. I'd like to introduce uh, tonight's speaker for, and I don't know why I know this, because I'm as innumerate as every other historian, but it's the 18th Milton, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Mitchell McGregor uh, lecture, and I only know that because I've been paying a lot of attention to it since they, uh, the department asked me to uh, host this year's, and I had no clue what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and so please forgive me for anything that goes wrong, but I'm not on your campus, so you will never see me again. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you some things about Professor Hardy Jackson, many of which are going to be true. That's a joke, come on, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Professor Hardy Jackson is a native of Grove Hill, Alabama, which is about the size of this room. He graduated from Birmingham Southern College with a bachelor's, University of Alabama with a master's, and those of us who went to Auburn will not hold that against him, and received his PhD from the University of Georgia. He's taught at colleges and universities in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, and has retired from Jacksonville State University, uh, where he held the position of eminent scholar in history. Dr. Jackson is the author, co-author, and co-editor of 11 books concerning Southern history. These include four that I have actually read, Rivers of History, Life on Acusa, Tallapoosa, Cahaba, and Alabama, Putting Loafing Streams to Work, The Building of Lay, Mitchell, Martin, and Jordan Dams, Inside Alabama, A Personal History of My State, and the book that we'll hear about tonight, the Rise and Decline of the Redneck Riviera. In addition, he served as editor of the Recreation um, volume, the 17th volume of the Encyclopedia of Southern Culture, and he writes award-winning newspaper columns and editorials. Dr. Jackson and his family now live in Seagrove Beach, Florida, and tonight's lecture will come from not only his research, but also from his lived experience. So without further ado, Dr. Hardy Jackson. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think considering where we are and uh, what we're about to undertake, it might be a good time to begin with a reading from the Holy Scripture which Troy was nice enough to have up here for me, even though I know the verse by heart. It's from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip and said, Arise, go toward the south. <laughs> and if any of you have recently heard the angel of the Lord, you went to the Redneck Riviera, because that is the south. I understand that one of the drawing cards for Troy is you can say, well, all you have to do is just go down the road, and you know, there it is. Well, all right. Redneck Riviera. Let's start with the name. Riviera. Back in 1931, the WPA guide to, the, to Alabama and the southern coast 
described the coast of Alabama and uh, Florida, Florida Panhandle as a string of little fishing villages that reminds one of the southern coast of France, the Riviera. Governor Bill Graves called Alabama's Gulf Coast Alabama's Riviera. That works. But what about redneck? Well, that gets touchy. I mean, if you ask somebody, usually, what is a redneck, they'll say, well, he's southern, yeah, working class, yeah. See if this is going to work now. How we go. <laughs> oh, by the way, I should add, even though I have a degree from, Auburn, from uh, University of Alabama, uh, I've been an Auburn fan since birth, and uh, my son graduated from Auburn recently, so I can go either way. All right. <laughs> well, Southern, working class, white, racist, a buffoon. Jeff Foxworthy, who made a lot of money off of, you must be a redneck if, you know, if you go to family reunions to pick up girls, you must be a redneck, you know, that type of thing. Uh, he was a little kinder. He said you could recognize a redneck by his glorious, or her, glorious lack of sophistication. I can go with that. The late, great Billy Carter, Jimmy's baby brother, was a little bit more precise. He was on the Johnny Carson show, and Johnny Carson, of course, is from the Midwest and doesn't know anything about the South. And Billy was telling him about his softball team in Plains, Georgia, and Billy said, well, they're just a bunch of good old boys. And Carson said, you mean rednecks? And Billy looked at him like he'd fallen off the turnip truck and said, no, I mean good old boys. And Carson said, well, what's the difference? Billy paused and kind of sucked his teeth. He said, well, a good old boy rides down the road in his pickup truck drinking a beer. And when he finishes, he puts the can in a litter bag. A redneck rides down the road in his pickup truck drinking a beer, and when he finishes, he throws the can out the window. Now, setting aside the fact that they shouldn't have been drinking and driving, you know, that, Billy was on to something. It's the outlaw. It's the refusal to accept the normal dictates of polite society. Uh, my people. <laughs> But where did they get them together, Redneck Riviera? Well, the first time I found it in print, it was in the by gum New York Times, of all places. Howell Raines, an Alabama boy, was writing an article for the Times about the doings of Kenny Stabler and Richard Todd down on a stretch of deserted beach that he called, he said, that local wags called the Redneck Riviera. Well, that was 1979, and Howell I went to school with Howell. So I got in touch with him and I said, okay, uh, where did you get the name? And I figured he'd say, well, I created, no, he said, I don't know. He said, it had just been floating around for a while. So of course, being a diligent researcher, just like all of your professors are, I went researching. And I discovered that down on the coast, there was a biology teacher and honky-tonk singer known as Shine. And Shine had a group called Blackwater, and they made a record called Redneck Riviera. I have an autographed copy. Of course, it's autographed to Edna, and I think she let me have it because she didn't want her husband to know she, anyway, that's the whole, what goes on at the beach stays at the beach, all right. But the stretch of beach that he was talking about begins somewhere around a little bit west of Gulf Shores, and runs until it reaches the floor of Bama, which sits on the beach. That's my daddy, by the way. Now, he passed away about seven, eight years ago, but I took him there uh, at one time, and he went in and walked around, and he came out, and he said, I'm just glad there's one of these places left. Yeah. Well, it sits right on the line with the bar part of it in Florida because of more liberal liquor laws which allows us to have the, uh, I'm not kidding you. Look, all of this is true. Y'all are taking notes, right? All right, all right, you're, and you've got a report to write. Okay, let me explain how you write this report. You start out by saying, 
He was brilliant. <laughs> and mumble along through it and all like that. And get to the end and you say, but he wasn't as good as you, doctor. And you leave, you know, fill in the blank. Okay? You'll be home free, no, no doubt. Well, anyway, it, it sits there. And, and it, of course, the motto down there, let's do it on the line, has a whole different effect. But anyway, we won't get into that. Uh, but uh, the Redneck Riviera and, and its Florida counterparts were at the time, right after, uh, right about the time Reigns was writing, it was mostly a scattering of vacation cottages where in one of them, one summer uh, person wrote, the breeze is blowing, the bourbon is flowing, and life is easy. There were honky-tonks. I have a cousin named Benny, that's, that's why I just love this picture. Uh, there were some picturesque but fairly seedy motels. Uh, shacks on pilings, and cafes that served smoked mullet, presided over by sunburned refugees from civilization. They, these, were the fine, these were the folks that were described by a writer on Sports Illustrated as skinny sunburnt men in Levi's and work, sh work shirts, half shot with drink, and wearing the faces of Confederate dead in Matthew Brady photographs. God, I wish I'd written that sentence. Isn't that great? Confederate, yeah. If you've ever been to the Bear Point Marina, you never mind, you don't. Prior to World War II, you had people like this, like Kenny Stabler, who, excuse me, after World War II, you had people like Kenny Stabler, who when one reporter asked him if all these stories about you is true, uh, Stabler said, I live the way I want to live. I don't give a damn if anybody likes it or not. I run hard as hell and don't sleep. I'm just here for the beer. I've been trying to wait for someone to get a t-shirt that says that. I'm just here for the beer. That's your chance, folks. You can make a bundle off of that one. Right. Well, prior to World War II, Alabama and Florida's Redneck Riviera was pretty well scattered out. Mostly fishing villages with a trickle of tourists from not too far away. Vacationers who came down to spend a week or two in mom and pop motor courts. They'd swim a little, fish a little, drink a little, eat raw oysters, buy something tacky at a local shop, and generally do things they could not do, would not do back home, especially if the preacher was watching. After the war, their numbers increased. What changed, one of the main changes, was that the American attitude toward leisure changed. Prior to World War II, vacations were for rich folks. Poor folks worked. They didn't have time off. And if they took time off, they were considered to be lazy, and lazy becomes indolent, and indolence becomes sorry as gully dirt. So, you know, you didn't take time off. After the war, largely through the influence of a more vibrant economy and labor unions, vacations became something you worked for, something you earned, something you could take. And Southerners took it to the South. They drove down here in military-improved roads. They came mainly from Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, and they brought with them the culture of the rising Southern middle class. They were white and were getting affluent. Children of the Great Depression, they were hardworking and frugal. But wartime experience had taught them that life was short and to be enjoyed. They brought with them their baby boomers, and coordinated trips with the children's vacations. Beach folks expanded their cottages to try to take advantage of this new trade. And cottages were really important, especially efficiencies. Although there were cafes down here, down there, um, they were places for a special treat, not for every meal. So people came down loaded with groceries, and many a family existed for a week on fried bologna sandwiches and whatever they called in the Gulf. Slowly the tourist economy grew. And by the 1960s, 1950s, the weeks between Memorial Day and Labor Day, the season, became a cash cow for locals. Come September, folks shut down and lived the rest of the year on what they made in the summer. Others shifted to winter jobs and waited. 
As for the people who came down here, they came to enjoy the beach, not to make it in their own image. Well, pretty soon, people began to invest, began to buy little, into little developments. These were a little more upscale than the, uh, uh, than the things that had been around there before. And many of them included covenants, which assured the buyer that, and I'm quoting from the covenant for this one, no tent, trailer, shack, outhouse, or temporary structure would be permitted, and no noxious activities, offensive noises, or odors would be allowed. Now, I can tr attest to you that some offensive noises and a few odors were, but never mind, all right. Since the buyers came from the racially segregated Lower South, the covenants also specified, as one did, that no property would be sold, leased, rented, or occupied by any person or persons other than the Caucasian race, although it added domestic servants of either race would be permitted. Well, this was the Redneck Riviera, although no one called it that then. It was the Gulf Shores or Orange Beach or Panama City Beach or simply the beach. It was small town segregated south without the racial diversity that you found inland. Along the coast, except for the occasional colored beaches, black faces were few. However, there was more going on besides middle class family focused summer entertainment. In February 1960, the Mobile Press Register sent out a warning that several hundred Alabama teenagers were expected to pay an early visit to the local beaches. Now this was a trend that had been growing along the coast since the mid-1950s. And it even inspired some civic groups in Panama City Beach to try to organize recreation for the visitors. One of the games that they had for them was find the penny in the pile of flour which revealed once again that the city fathers didn't have a clue. In one leaning toward reality, the city council of Panama City debated asking local merchants not to sell beer during spring break. Reality killed that idea very quickly, which I, I interviewed the uh, chief of police down there at the time, and I asked him about that, and he said, I don't know why they were worried about those kids could find beer in Saudi Arabia. No. The youth invasion, you, you like that, huh? <laughs> it gets better, trust me, all right. Uh, the youth invasion was accelerated when in 1960, mid-1960s, Where the Boys Are came out, a movie about spring break in Fort Lauderdale. Well, up until then, only the hardcore students went to the Gulf Coast for spring break. It was cold and windy, and the beach back then, the break, spring break back then was only a couple of days, AEA holidays, Thursday and Friday. There just wasn't much time to do things. But when the boys, where the boys are came out, students began thinking, it may be cold at the beach, but it's cool to be there, and cool offsets being cold any day. And so, here they came. Which one of you picks out your daddy in there? <laughs> Communities along the coast had to decide whether the income from the invasion was worth the hassle and the damages. And as communities do, would do from that time forward, the beach towns took the money. So another season was born. From mid-March to mid-April, high school and college students ruled the coast. Then they went home, leaving the motel owners time to clean up before the families arrived in June. Now, uh, to accommodate this expanding tourist market, more and more motels were built. They were, for the most part, of a single plan. On or across the road from the beach, two or three stories, less than 100 units, maybe a cafe or a bar, if not within walking distance to one, and the close to things for the kids to do, putt-putt golf, an amusement park for the little ones, and a hangout for the teenagers. That guy, I did this program in Birmingham, and after it was over, that guy came out and he said, that's me. 
that's Cubby. <laughs> Good guy. He's in the book, too, by the way, so he was real, real happy. He autographed me a, a copy of his picture in the book. Um, well, the hangout, of course, complete with jukebox. It got to the same point where the same people came down the same time every year, and motel reunions were the highlight of the trip. And because one could count on tourists from being largely from the same places, local establishments catered to their particular likes and dislikes. One of the most popular bars on the Panama City Beach was the Little Birmingham. And on any given night, it was full of people from, you guessed it, Birmingham. All right. These offsprings of the early pioneers, these, these baby boomers, children of post-war passion, uh, they were part of the youth rebellion of the 50s and 60s, but with a twist. Yes, they danced to the Beatles and the Stones, but they also danced to Leonard Skinner and the Allman Brothers. In the clubs, they danced to the music that they danced to and danced to fraternity parties in Tuscaloosa, Auburn, and of course, Troy. Sometimes the bands were black, but the dancers were always white. Alcohol, in beer, beer in particular, was the drug of choice. Though it was not long before the ever-vigilant Mobile Press Register reported that the scourge of reefer had arrived, and that a person who smokes the weed will believes, quote, there is nothing he isn't capable of doing or saying, and in some instances it makes the user run amok. <laughs> well, since doing and saying whatever you wanted to and running amok were what attracted students to the coast, it was advertisement, you see. But by the 1970s, the Alabama coast consisted of a few family-type motels, a state park with campgrounds, and a collection of charter boat outfits, bait shop, piers, docks. Scattered in between was found a collection of vacation cottages, mostly belonging to South Alabama folks, and beach bars that were found along the Gulf. The LA Pub and Grub, the Bear Point Marina, the Pink Pony, there was one night at the Pink Pony, and I just stumbled on this by accident, so I have no picture. There was an all-girl Elvis imitator band. Let that sink in for a minute. These were Elvis and Pertus personators, and they were all girls, and the name of the band was Elvis Herselvius. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> The people along the coast uh, would finally end up concentrating on the one bar that, for the most part, became the epitome of redneck recreation, the floor ballot, and, of course, the mullet toss, the interstate mullet toss. Okay, a word about the tossing. The last weekend in April was the dullest weekend of the year. Spring breakers were gone. Families hadn't come in yet. So a bunch of guys were sitting around the floor of Bama trying to decide how to liven it up. And someone came up with the idea of a contest. Now, there are two stories relating to this. And both of them involved Jimmy Lewis, who was a uh, singer, hanger-on at the floor of Bama. And I interviewed Jimmy, and he said, well, one story is that I saw a cow patty toss out west and thought, why don't we toss something? Well, that sounded good to everybody. But what you gonna toss? Mullet. Mullet? Well, mullet is the common man's fish, the rabbit of the ocean. Mullet is a bottom feeder. Mullet swims in schools. And they jump in schools. Scientists were trying to figure out why the mullets all jump up at the same time, and instead of going back in, like most fish do, head first, they just kind of flop in. And the scientists studied this and studied this and concluded they do it for the hell of it. They're a lot like the folks at the floor of Alabama. However, Jimmy Lewis tells a little bit different story. You know, if you can't have two stories, why not? He said he thought it up one night in what he described as a fit of narcosis. He said, I got stoned and it came to me. 
I have him on tape and he signed the waiver. All right. <laughs> well, now, have, how many of you have ever been to the mullet toss? Okay, fess up now. Come on. We got two out there. Oh, listen. It's real simple. You stand in the ring, the circle, the mullet are in the bucket, in water. You cannot use gloves. You cannot put sand on them. You've got to stay in the ring, and you throw it. In this case, you were throwing from Alabama to Florida, hence the interstate mullet toss. And once it lands, the mullet girls come out, and they measure how far the mullet has been thrown. But you've got to go get it. They're not going to pick that nasty thing up. And after it's over, the mullets are fed to the seagulls. Back when he was 16, I took my son uh, and took a picture of him and this fine young lady. And he, I told him later on, I said, well, I'm probably going to uh, use that picture in an article I'm doing for Southern Cultures magazine. He said, oh, wow, you think she'll see it and get in touch? I said, honey, I don't think she reads Southern Cultures magazine. <laughs> My daughter and her best friend, who happens to be a student at Troy, have been badgering me for the last few years to take them to this. So far, I have held out. So far. Oh. Well, this was the Redneck Riviera distilled to its essence. It was said that down there, there were two types of people upper crust matronly Rotarians with cash register eyeballs. Other, the Stabler gang. Raffish, sunburnt, hard of hand, tyrannical of glance. Then came two storms, Eloise and Frederick. In 1976 and again in 1979, a year after Rains was writing about the region, the storms hit the Alabama and Florida coast with 120 mile an hour winds and a record storm surge. Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, Panama City Beach sustained heavy damage. The future of the Red Knight Riviera did not look bright, unless, of course, you were in Destin, because Destin's local Chambers of, Chamber of Commerce immediately sent out word all over the southeast. Panama City is destroyed. Gulf Shores is destroyed. Destin wasn't touched. And, people, and that was the thing that began the change that turned Destin into one of the busiest places along the coast. The storms taught coastal folks a lesson. Storms destroy, but they also clear the ground to build. Before Frederick, Gulf Shores had a chain, one chain motel, a couple of small condominiums, a few restaurants, bars, and beach cottages. There was one bank, no supermarkets. The hurricane leveled most of it. Then came the easy credit and looser regulations of the 1980s. Banks had money to loan, and baby boomers, now in their 30s and approaching their 40s, were ready to borrow. Having learned to love the beach in their youth, they wanted to recapture the magic without having to sleep tend to a room. So they began to buy a piece of it. Folks who had seen their cottages wash away were wondering how they could rebuild. And they began to get offers of money that they never dreamed for their little pieces of property. They took it. Some held out. By the way, that's an awful lot like me right there. We have, we're one of the last one-story houses on 30A. And by God, we're going to hang on to it, too. <laughs> My kids better not. I'll come back and haunt them if they get <laughs> All right. Where there was beach property to be developed, there were developers to develop it. With few environmental controls and with county governments in the hands of inland agricultural in interests who cared little for the coast, the foxes were loose in the hen house. Folks playing big bucks for a condo were generally not the sort who came down to redneck it up. Maybe they once had been, but not anymore. So they brought a lifestyle that was a far cry from pe what people brought to the beach a decade or so before. First with money from a hot stock market, 
Then with low interest loans after the dot-com bubble burst, baby boomers began to buy into the coast that a baby boomer generation of developers was developing to sell them. So up went the condos. And up, and up went the places for recreational shopping, recreational eating, leisure activities, and of course the universal panacea golf, all to keep owners and visitors entertained. At the same time, the rapid rise in property values made a house or a condo on the co coast, coast blah, 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 on the coast a much better investment than the intemperate stock market. So it was that the Redneck Riviera became an investment opportunity for some and a place for calculated, carefully controlled leisure for others. Meanwhile, more and more of the sort of people who had come down to make the region what it once was were either priced out of the high-rise stuff or pushed into a sinking, shrinking selection of motels and condos. The places they once frequented, the bars and seafood joints, were replaced by in vogue eateries and designer decor and ferns. One story captures it all. Back about 15 years ago, I invited some friends of ours from Atlanta down to, to visit. Um, the man is very much like me, just you know, we'll let that stand the way it is. His wife, however, was a uh, yuppie sophisticate from north side of Atlanta who came in wearing J. Crew and all of that other stuff and carrying a Dunian pur uh, purse that probably cost more than the waitress who served us at the cafe earned. But we, I took them to one of my back bay places that ate mm, great fried food. And uh, we sat down and the waitress came over and she said, what do you have, honey? I, a waitress, I love a waitress that calls me honey. Her tip goes up at least 15 cents right there. I said, I'll have a beer, and my friend said he'd have a beer, and my wife said she'd have a beer. And the Atlanta lady looked up and she said, do you have Chardonnay? The waitress paused for a moment and said, we don't serve no foreign beer here. <laughs> it was a great moment. About six weeks later, I went back by, went in, and they had a wine list. Okay, it was up on the chalkboard and it said, we have wine, red, white, and pink, but it was the beginning. The next time I went, they were serving appetizers. Within a year, they closed. They got too fancy for the old crowd and weren't fancy enough for the new. Today is an empty lot. My heart sinks every time we go by. Now, you remember the folks that I was describing to you, the upper crust matronly Rotarians with cash register eyeballs and the Stabler gang, raffish heart of hand, sunburnt? Well, by the 1990s, it seemed to me that those two groups had mated and they had produced a generation of raffish Rotarians, pirates with cash register eyeballs and hard-handed matrons. But you know, in many ways, these raffish Rotarians and hard-handed matrons were just as freewheeling as the less sophisticated rednecks they replaced. They just had more money and built better. State and county building codes had been tightened largely as a result of the insurance industry. And old construction was grandfathered in waiting around for the next blow. This is actually one of the older condominiums on that stretch of the beach. Well, the next blow came with a vengeance in 2004, when Hurricane Ivan blew right in on top of Orange Beach and tore the Redneck Riviera apart. It did more damage than Hurricane Frederick because more had been built since Hurricane Frederick. A year later, Hurricane Dennis hit them, roared right through the same path. And so during the first decade of the new millennium, the Redneck Riviera was a region in ruins, in transition, and in conflict. Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, Panama City Beach, once playgrounds for people like Stabler and his gang, became get-rich opportunities for aging baby boomers whose children were out of the nest and left their parents with a little bit more money to spend. Aided by liberal lending policies, pliable local governments, aggressive developers and hyperactive real estate agents, 
Baby boomers began to buy pre-construction condo units, resell them for a profit before a nail was driven to someone who would sell again, and sometimes as many as five times before somebody got a set of keys. This flipping created a reality show on television, it became a nationwide phenomenon, and it was what one writer down on the coast called condomania. One as enterprising real estate agent organized his flippers into what he called the Dolphin Club. Cute, right? Dolphin Club flipper. Oh, I got one. Soon, many of the mom and pop motels and vacation cottages and low rise condos were replaced by double digit storied condominiums whose absentee owners planned to watch their investment grow while they made mortgage papers with rents to the snowbirds who came in winter and to anybody else who had the money the rest of the year. Snowbirds. <laughs> the snowbird trade had been growing and became an important part of the economy by the 1970s and in the 1980s. Retirees from the north descended on the coast looking for a place that was a little warmer at a price a little less than they'd have to pay for the south. Now, these were not the well-heeled ones who went to Miami and Fort Lauderdale. In income and attitude, there were an awful lot like folks in the middle class southerners who came to the beach after World War II. And rather than redneck it up, they were more inclined to sit by the pool in the sun, play cards at the senior, senior citizen center, some of them which were open for them, hit the buffets for the early bird special, and maybe drop by a local bar for a beer before going to bed, which always came early. Full-time residents were a mixed mind about this migration south. Chambers of Commerce loved them and the money they spent, although they wished they would spend more. There was a running joke that a Canadian comes down with a white shirt and a $100 bill and doesn't change either. Locals also complained that the old and the northern drove too slow, clogged up the checkout lines in the grocery store, were, reared, were rude and pushy, but more than anything else, they were Yankees which explained the popular bumper sticker that read, if this is snowbird season, why can't I shoot one? <laughs> and there were other tensions. The culture that gave rise to the Redneck Riviera and its antisocial activities was also a culture full of churchgoers who wanted to visit the beach for family activities that were for them family activities that did not include alcohol and all that went along with it. However, once they arrived, they found for every goofy golf course, water park, carnival-like attraction, where mama, daddy, and the kids could ride the rides and play games in a family-friendly atmosphere, there was a bar or a club or a liquor store or a lounge, often in the very motel where they were staying. What's a good Christian family to do? Why, go to a church retreat. During the boom of the 80s, a number of large churches in cities like Atlanta and Birmingham bought old motels, refurbished them, and turned them into places where other churches would feel safe taking their youth groups. Local churches encouraged this and opened their doors to the vistas. More conservative in dress, no bikinis. Mm -hmm. More organized in activities, they represented an aspect of white, middle-class South that those who focus on the region's redneck side generally overlook. And then there was also the question of who owns the beach. Well, that wasn't a question back in the stabler days. There was plenty of beach to go around. So those seeking a spot in the sand were seldom in conflict with those who owned Gulf Front property. Motels often denied the public use of their access points but anyone who wanted to sit on a motel beach could just simply walk in from next door. However, as more and more people came to the beach and set up umbrellas and canopies in, which, in what some beachfront owners considered their backyards, you began to see keep off private property signs. The matter came to a head in 2004 and 2005 when the storms eroded the beach and the tourist development folks sought government help to rebuild, re-nourish, what was considered the main attraction of the region. Some property owners, fearing the government restored the beach and would also claim ownership, went to court to stop the restoration. They failed. The case went all the way to the United, uh, United States Supreme Court, 
which ruled that restoration was a legitimate act of government, and if public money restored the beach, it was a public beach. Meanwhile, those with unrestored beaches continued to declare their beach private. It's not completely settled yet. Yet of all the clashes, cultural and otherwise, that were going along along the coast, the one that seemed to capture the difference and the similarities between people who created the Redneck Riviera and the ones who are shaping it today took place in the spring of 2008 when the town of Orange Beach decided to build a second public boat ramp. Of the many ways that local folks down there put the redneck into the river, folks who put the redneck into the Riviera expressed themselves, few said it better than their relationship to their boats. A boat told you a lot about the person who owned it, which is hardly surprising since boaters considered the crafts an extension of their own personalities. Whether it was built for sailing or speed or for fishing or for anything, whether used on the intercoastal waterway or back in the creeks and marshes or powered out into the Gulf, the boats were lovingly maintained and treated with respect. But boats need water. And since most boat owners did not have a dock, they depended on public ramps, the common man's marina. Orange Beach had one public ramp. Parking was limited. And so as the weather warmed and the boaters arrived, trucks and trailers spilled out of the lot onto the shoulders of the road. Neighbors complained. And that was the pollution. The ramp was on a slow moving bayou, so the gas and oil that spilled into the water did not flush out. Environmentalists, whose influence on coastal planning had increased over the years, called for the city to do something to clean up the mess. Well, the city had a solution. At the east end of the town was a plot of waterfront land, city owned, with access to the pass that led to the Gulf. It was undeveloped, big enough for a ramp, parking lot, and restroom facilities. Perfect, only it wasn't. At least not to the owners of upscale condominiums nearby and the folks in the mega mansions over on Unol Island, which is across there, who claimed that the rednecks and their boats would take away their peace and tranquility and spoil their quality of life. Well, the city council knew that most of the condo and ono owners were not residents and therefore didn't vote. On the other hand, many of the boaters lived in town. Plans for the ramp went ahead. So the, bon so the opponents tried another tactic. Stop the ramp to save the beach mouse. Well, in recent years, federal environmental protection laws had been used to stop a number of projects change the habit of beachgoers. Down in Walton County, Florida, which is the closest shot that you've got down here, regulations to save sea turtles put an end to the longstanding tradition of leaving chairs, tents, canopies, and other things on the beach overnight. Out on the Fort Morgan Peninsula, plans for development was put on hold when it was determined that the endangered beach mouse habitat would be threatened. Well, the opponents of the uh, of, of the uh, uh, landing uh, reasoned if the beach mice could stop a condominium, they could stop a ramp. Though up until then, the folks on Ono had been in the condos had shown little, if any, interest in saving the beach mice, overnight they became advocates for the endangered rodent. To help them with the crusade, they brought in environmentalists who they were sure would be their allies. It didn't work as planned. When the environmentalists appeared before the city council, they testified that building the ramp wouldn't endanger the beach mouse because there were no beach mice where the ramp was to be built. <laughs> Surprised but undeterred, the opponents announced that they would catch some mice at another location and turn them loose there. Won't work, said the environmentalist the feral cats will eat them. Now, feral cats had been a problem for native, native species for some time, but this particular cat population had a specific origin. 
It seemed that when the nearby condominium developers were, being, were planning, someone pointed out to the developer that he would have trouble getting the necessary permits because he was going to build on property that was beach mouse habitat. Not to worry, said the Raffish Rotarian developer, and he went down to the local animal shelter and adopted some cats and turned them loose. The beach mouse problem was solved, and a cat problem was in its place. To comp what they decided, now, now I made a suggestion at the time that what they ought to have is, is a great cat hunt, but uh, they turned that down rather quickly. Uh, to complicate matters, some local ladies whose political, who had political connections were feeding the cats. And they were out of mice, so naturally they were hungry. Uh, so condo coalitions hired a professional trapper to humanely trap the cats. Unfortunately, the trapper trapped a cat that wasn't feral, that belonged to a lady of, with political connections. The problem still is not resolved today. But in Alabama, at least, the courts seem to be siding with the rednecks. When Hurricane Iving battered the beach in 2004, it destroyed the lodge at Alabama's Gulf State Park. That was where that vacant lot is right there. The lodge was a simple, some would say Spartan structure. Before the storm, someone had suggested that it be preserved as a historical monument to show everybody what a Redneck Riviera motel looked like. But it was gone. In its place, under the administration of Governor Barb Riley, plans were laid for building a large convention center with an upscale motel. Critics sued, claiming the governor's plan not only violated state leasing laws, but failed to take into account, quote, the average per capita average family income of Alabamians, the ones who had used the old facility and now couldn't afford the new one. The courts agreed that the plan was illegal and the decision was hailed as a victory for the folks who put the redneck in the Riviera. Meanwhile, traditional beachgoers were getting another break. The heady days of condomania, dolphin clubs were coming to an end. The warning signs were up already when in late 2008, the housing bubble burst. As one real estate agent put it, the flippers flopped. Pre-construction loan dried up, Grand plans were put on the shelf, scores of units sat forlorn and empty, and developers trying to get, who couldn't get any financing began considering hotels and convention centers for paying guests instead of condos for flipping. And then just as things looked dark, a light appeared. As condo prices fell, cautious buyers began to emerge. People who were more interested in a vacation place that could generate a little money on the side than a quick sale and resale for profit. These folks, mostly from the lower south, were much like their parents and grandparents who'd come to the coast in the 50s and 60s. White, middle class, comfortably so, and with just enough red redneckery in them to keep places like the Floribama open. Even the disastrous BP, BP oil spill did not deter them, slowed them a bit, but when the oil was cleaned up, they joined Jimmy Buffett down on the coast to celebrate the coast and all it had to offer. To help them party, another generation of developers, raffish Rotarians, parish, parish, pirates with cashier at the eyeballs, and hard-handed matrons were there anxious to serve. Though much of the old Redneck Riviera has declined and fallen dormant, from these, new, these seeds, a new one may grow. There are signs that it might. After the Deepwater Horizon spill, it was announced that some of BP money would be used to restore tourism, and some of that would be used to sponsor concerts that would attract people who would come down and spend big. However, when it was announced that one of the concerts would feature Leonard Skinner, the band whose song Freebird has been called the Redneck National Anthem, not everyone was happy. A Skinnerd concert, one critic wrote in the local newspaper, would attract people who were neither good for the region's image or its economy. Every toothless redneck from 100 miles, the writer complained, 
would bring in their own bush and natty light and food. They'd set up lawn chairs, sing along with Sweet Home Alabama, and then leave. The only way for local business to make any money would be to open a cheap cigarette and cut a Confederate bandana shop. But something else happened. The people who collected at the concert were neither toothless rednecks nor yuppie sophisticates. The crowd looked and acted a lot like beach folks have always looked and acted. And why not? They were the children, and in some cases the grandchildren, of the people who came over the years who had come to the coast to swim, fish, ride the rides at the amusement park, bow a mullet, stay up late at local watering holes, party during spring break, and generally do what they could not do, would not do at home. In them, what the redneck really was still lives on. And as for the folks who weren't there, the ones who stayed comfortable and secure in their condos and gated communities, they missed a good time, and they never knew it. Thank you. Thank you.